I've been waiting all day for this. Baron, my handsome man. Hi, human. Hey, babe, you ready? All right, let's roll it. Um, so welcome back to another episode of Soul Sense, where today I am beyond excited to have three very influential women in my life, whether they know it or not, um, here with me to have a chat uh, about a new journey that I've been um, sort of forging down uh, in my life, which is the journey of walking away from alcohol um, in a society that all, all we all seem to drink alcohol and everything is, is celebrated around this. So uh, kind of going around the clock to to uh, the side of me is Laura. So Laura, I'm really, really happy that you're here. And then Samantha just below there and uh, Mary Jo as well. So welcome, ladies, um, to Soul Sense, to this new platform that we've created. And uh, so I wanted to land with all of you just first to, to first kind of check in and see how everyone's doing. So Laura, how are things with you? Things are good. I'm I just going through the motions. I'm going to be heading back to work for full time on June 7th. So I'm looking forward to that. So I'm going to get some more um, routine in my life. But I've really adjusted now. I just I do my runs. I work out and I get outside into the sunshine when it's shining. So I kind of started enjoying my time away and time at home. I, I, love, that. I, <laughs> I love that. Sam, how are you doing? Smith, how are you kind of through all of this? And how are you just doing today? Well, I would totally agree with Laura. I feel like it's been, well, it has been like a really difficult time for many people, right? I just find that the slower pace of life has been a real treat. And it's just something that, um, I wouldn't have otherwise been able to experience, I don't think. So I've got a little guy, he'll be sick soon and just spending extra time with him and not having like the regular pull from work and every day. I don't know. Life just gets so busy before you notice it. The days are just like flying by. Right. So I've really enjoyed that part of it, but yeah, I'm also getting busier at work and Ben's going back to daycare. So That'll be coming to an end for me soon. <laughs> it, 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 isn't it? It's so interesting how we might have been resistant and accepting, and now we're resistant to leave yeah. some, some certain things. Uh, Mary Jo, how are you doing? How has it been for you? And have you also been off work or no, just working? No, well, my work would have ended by now anyway, because I teach at Queens. So normally I'm off at this time of year. But um, it was a bit of an adjustment because classes ended early. They ended the first week of March, which was quite early. So all that land of term getting students ready for final assessments was very weird doing it online. Weird, not weird for me, weird for them. Um, but um, I'm good. I, I uh, like everybody else, I spend a lot of time exercising and um, yoga and riding horses and hanging out. And it's actually been, I've got a kind of a daily routine now. So that it's been, it's actually kind of great. And I know I'm going to be teaching remotely in the fall. So I'm okay with that. You know, it's a well, bit I of a was, it's Sorry? I was just, you teach for the law. You're teaching in yeah. law. So I was actually just having a conversation with um, Laura and Samantha that I, I understood that the law department was the only department at Queens that wanted to have in-person classes back in the fall. <laughs> Interesting <laughs> you to mention that. Uh, <laughs> I, it's the first year students that really are pushing because they haven't had the experience of being together on campus. And so they're quite unhappy about having it all remote. But um, we've been told that if we don't want to, we don't have to. And it would only happen anyway if the government says it's safe. So okay. at this point, 
um, it's not safe. You right. couldn't do it now. So I don't, uh, I don't envision it being, I don't know how you could make it safe. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see how they do uh, homecoming and Frosh Week. Uh, all oh, the homecomings, homecomings canceled. Yeah, That's well, I've heard that they're doing it through like a Zoom platform. I don't know. <laughs> so strange to me it's just like it's just a it's just a reason uh for everyone to get to party which is something that i'm not doing yeah unlikely there's going to be drunk parties in the street so overall it's um it's been pretty great actually i'm really i'm finally adjusting to my new hair i love it just it once now so I have no control over this. Folks. Everything's just just doing its own thing. I love that the um, it, it's funny because we are in. Not only are we in a pandemic, there is also so many other issues that are happening right now um, in our world for so many other things. But that the the underlying tone with all of you is that we're all doing pretty well, and so I feel really grateful that that each of you is in that place. Um, and then it, I, I sort of want to just jump right in to, to why we're here and the thing that connects me to all of you. And that is um, that we all at some point in our lives, whether it's, you know, some of us are fresh in a few months, coming up on a year. Mary Jo, I think you've mentioned to me that it's been 30 years for you mm -hmm. since you uh, touched alcohol, which actually, uh, the minute you said that to me one night, um, I was like, oh, I got this. Like, I got this. But then also, I'll, I'm going to throw my disclaimer out, which is, I am free of alcohol in my life, but I am not free of cannabis. That is still my. Um, no, I you still know. use cannabis. I mean, yeah. I, it is a social tool. Uh, it's something I use as a sleep aid, as a pain aid. It's mm -hmm. not, it hasn't replaced alcohol, if that makes any sense. And the yep, cannabis, absolutely. I use it for arthritis pain and for, um, and I use very small doses i'm not right but i don't i don't see it as a replacement for oh, let's go and have a few beers you know <laughs> right it, and, and i very much do that as well i think it's uh it, it's recreational in my life it is for some other reasons but i've yeah. i've also started tapping in to ask myself why i do it the same way that i would have yeah, yeah. to ask myself why i was turning um to alcohol and so when i when I use cannabis, it's always it, it always has to be in a way where I'm not masking or running from something, and then I yeah. feel it's the proper way of using it. Um, yeah. But I'm gonna, Laura, I'm gonna start with you and and sort of asking you, and I, I love you know share and uh, as open as you can be. What was it that prompted you to want to live a life without alcohol? Because we it, it's everywhere. Um, it's what everybody does all the time, and it's it's almost not socially acceptable to not drink. It feels like sometimes. Mm -hmm. so can you share yeah. a bit of that with us? Um, honestly, it was like it wasn't just an over the night decision to like want to stop. It was ongoing rep repetition every weekend. I would wake up on Sunday or Saturday morning feeling horrible, and I think I just abused it far too much. Um, other things came along with it, like the party lifestyle. Like my nickname was Vegas. Um, first year of university and I just always partied like that was my identity was I was a party girl I could get through school <laughs> and I could party and it was just something I really I loved like I felt like I was who I was meant to be when I was partying but between the last um, probably three to five years when I met my current partner it just I started getting really sad and I'd get super depressed and I was like what is causing this and I would think it was everything else besides the drinking or the drugs and um I eventually figured it out but I tried I had a lot of day ones and it wouldn't stick and I'd get like a month and I'd be like yeah let's reward myself I'm gonna go drink this weekend because I can do 30 days and I did that a whole bunch of times and I had this gold star reward system on my calendars and I'd like white knuckle like I didn't need to I wasn't like drinking every single day, but I would really look forward to it. So I'd white knuckle to the weekend and I'd just drink Saturdays. And then I was like, yeah, just Saturdays, but I'd live all week to get to Saturday to party. Um, and then just one day I made the decision to quit and I was very open with my partner and I went and talked to a therapist. And I think I said this in the last time we talked to Ash, um, I was having problems like with my family and I was just kind of falling apart and, 
she asked me, she's like, do you think you're drinking has anything to do with all these problems that you're coming to me about? And I was like, oh, no, not at all. Like, no, <laughs> totally not anything to do with it. And then within the next week, I had like a blowout um, with my current partner and everything's resolved and okay now. But I went back to her and she asked me again and I just broke down. I was like, yeah, I was like, I got to let this out. This is the center of all my issues, my anxiety, my stress, my anger. and I really it just all came together and I realized I really shouldn't be drinking because that's what's limiting me in my life. And that's what's making me have to go to a therapist. That's what's making me feel shitty. And I hate admitting it, like not hate, but it just kind of sucks. Now when I see people drinking through the, this time, I still get that. Why can't I be like them? Why can't I enjoy it? <laughs> and then I'm like, you don't want to, you don't need it. And then I find comfort in knowing that I don't need it anymore. But I guess kind of tangent it off there, but I was just sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. Yeah, I, I think that the one thing that we're really good at doing too is covering that up, right? That alcohol causes us to run from that thing, but uh, I can relate to that in so many ways. Um, I think the difference being now when I see people drinking, I actually don't have that feeling of like, why can't I be like that? I know that mm -hmm. because my my walking away from alcohol was because I did, you know, I, I did the personality, uh, I moved from drugs to alcohol, so then it became a problem for me. So it isn't just something I moved away from because I, I you know, chose to do that. It, I moved away from it because I chose that I wanted to live a healthier life, but I know I can't go back to it. Um, and I'll ask Mary Jo and Samantha the same thing, but do you think not drinking, Laura, in this is still a superpower for you? Sorry, do I think not drinking is a superpower? Yeah. Yes. And I really like, I really have latched on to it. I find every day I can feel myself getting stronger and stronger. And it's not that I want to drink. It's just like when I reflect and I find I go into like, I observe people a lot. And I said that too last time too. I find myself really paying attention to everyone around me who is, mm -hmm. especially during this time. And I just, I feel very strong and I'm so grateful that I quit drinking. Like 2020, I'd said it was going to be my year. I was going to be sober. It's going to be a year sober in July. And I was like, I can't wait to see what happens. And I feel like I was preparing for this because if I wasn't already sober and had some time under my belt, I know the damage I'd be doing to myself right now. And it'd be three months of hell. So I'm Great. good. And I'm, I do feel super strong. I feel powerful because a lot of people can't do this or choose not to do this. I think everyone can do it though, if they really want to. And if they get I think every, yeah, I think everyone's capable of that. Is any part of um, Laura's experience, does that resonate with e either uh, you, Samantha, or you, Mary Jo at all in um, your sort of exit, you know, from alcohol? I'd say for sure, I really um, like the use of the word limit. I saw um, an interview with Bradley Cooper and he doesn't drink alcohol and he said it was sometime in his 20s that he just realized that if he continued on like this like he would just never reach his full potential as a human and that line i just thought wow that's so powerful because it's just so true it just limits you like keeps you down feeling like crap and like stuck in that cycle and you don't know what's wrong but you do know what's wrong but you just don't want to admit it right so I, yeah, I totally resonates with me as for sure. Okay. Yeah, I, um, it's been so long for me now that I, I don't see it as a superpower anymore. Um, some of my family sees it as mildly annoying. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was a superpower as a parent, I have to tell you huge superpower as a parent because I raised four kids and I found that um, because I had the moral high ground, I could say, well, I don't drink <laughs> and I am lots of fun. So, you know, it was much easier for me to give that message without being a hypocrite. You know, it wasn't like I was saying, well, I know how to drink, but you don't. It was, um, best you don't and that one so i would always be very cautious around their alcohol use but the other thing i had for them the other saying i had for them which they will repeat to this day is that nothing good happens after midnight 
So you go to. You've said that to me before. <laughs> it's true, little girl. It's true. <laughs> it really is true. And so between that and alcohol use, I mean, they've they've turned out to be really. Um, they do drink, but in moderation, and they'll go for weeks without. So I think uh, it sort of resonates what Laura said there. I, it did at the beginning. But I'll, I'll tell you that story later when it's my turn. But it, at the beginning, it certainly feel as if I grew wings all of a sudden because I wasn't drinking. I love that. Well, why don't we? Well, well, why don't you go ahead and tell us that story now, and then we'll we'll come back and um, touch with what Samantha is saying because I I'm so curious. I don't know Mary Jo what it was uh, for you in your life. I just know how I've known you. And I've always known you to be one of the most fun human beings that I've experienced. I mean, I've been to the farm. We've gone horseback riding together. We, you know, you are just everything about your soul is so um, magnetic and energetic. And, and so I think that's also when you say 30 years, I'm like, God, I just like, I aspire to be that way. So, so take us through your story and what kind of brought you here. It was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> <laughs> All stories start like that. No, uh, well, in my youth, when I, I uh, first of all, through my undergrad, of course, it was the 70s, everyone drank and drank and drank and drank. Um, so undergrad, yes, yes. But then I got a job in Fairly Hill, um, working for the Liberal Party and working for a Liberal MP. And politicians drink like there is no tomorrow. At least they did. They drink like all the beer is going to run out and you have to drink it or that it goes bad and you have to drink it all so to be part of that job you just drank and drank and drank so that got me to about 1982 um, and then i started law school and lawyers drink and drink, and drink. <laughs> it's part of the so they can't uh, they don't socialize without alcohol right there's always even now this may be damped down a little, but ah, not as much as I'd like. So there's always booze. And um, there were a few things I noticed during that time. I made a lot of bad decisions, uh, like waking up beside people I didn't know every weekend. And um, it was the 70s and 80s again, you know, and then we all wore the beard. You don't, the you don't have to justify it. <laughs> it was, you know, so I, and, and like, Laura, feeling sick was, you know, I had terrible hangovers. Like they were just death defying and shame. I would wake up and I would realize that all the funny that is me was um, coming out as hurtful sometimes because I was funny at everyone else's expense. And then I'd be really sad and remorseful. And I was just so. And then I married my first husband and. Um, he seemed to realize it was a very abusive relationship and he seemed to realize that when I drank, I was weak and he could be talked into anything or would do a lot of things that would ordinarily be outside my comfort zone. So I don't want to say he plied me with alcohol, but, but he, he certainly encouraged alcohol use. It kept me on a shorter leash and then um, I got pregnant with my third. So I didn't drink during any pregnancy. So I would get pregnant, stop drinking immediately. Couldn't wait to start again. It was like, oh my God, I'm, beard. I'm supposed to be good for your breast milk. I can drink. Um, I got pregnant with my third and something, it was, I realized the marriage was wrong and that I was, it took me one more baby to get out of it, but uh, I realized I had to stop. And I did. I, it's easy to quit while you're pregnant. So all of you have made a choice to quit when you're not. And I think that that's admirable. I'm not sure I could have done that. When I drank, when I was pregnant, I, alcohol made me sick. So I couldn't touch it. So I just didn't start drinking again after that third one. And, um, it was uh, difficult in the sense that my husband was furious, absolutely furious, because he no longer had that control over me. He couldn't get me wasted and 
bad things would happen. So um, that was very difficult, but the rest was easy. It made, I made better decisions. I was able to sleep better. I, there were a whole bunch of things that I was able to address sort of long-standing things in my life that I couldn't address when I was drinking all the time. So that's the Reader's Digest version. Why, there's a lot of backstory there too. Why did I stay sober? It's probably a question that I ask myself, why, you know, I'm, I'm in a good place in my life. Surely I could enjoy a drink, but I know I can't. I, I know that I cannot. And the only thing I miss is champagne because it was just so exquisite and such a nice tasting drink and it just was wonderfully elegant and fun. But I, I can't drink. I, I know that, that I go into a really nasty spot physically and mentally when I drink. It all seems great until it isn't. So that was, that was kind of, it was to protect myself, I guess, at the end of the day and to protect my children. And they did need a lot of protecting. Um, so it was easier if I was sober. I think... Um one of the most beautiful things that you can say in that is that even 30 years later, you still recognize that it's something you can't do. And mm -hmm. I think that that also is something I can relate to. It isn't, it isn't, and I know Samantha, you and I have talked about this. Uh, it isn't just one drink for me. Like one drink okay. is opening the floodgate because that self-control um, would oh, then be gone. After one beer, after one beer. done. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also you, you make a good point. And, and I read an article about this, um, it, how when we sign up, when we start drinking, we're actually giving away everything, right? We're giving away our reaction time, our own safety. Like there's just so many things that we're signing off on and then going out into the world. And we are actually making ourselves the most vulnerable version of ourselves that we possibly can when we're choosing to do it. Um, so to protect yourself, that's a beautiful way. Of, of seeing that, I think. It's, it's pretty remarkable to know that that feeling, because maybe uh, both Laura and Samantha can um, agree with that, is that it just, I just can't. If I have a drink, I'm going to start drinking again. That it's okay. not the other one. Well, like Laura, I was the of the party. I was a hilarious party girl. Like really oh, yeah. I just hilarious. Never just right? one. That was Never, like the oh. That was like the line you'd say in serving, like you'd finish your shift and all of us would say, let's just go for one. And then the next day we're like, why do we always do this? It's like 50. <laughs> it's, you know, three in the morning and you close yeah. the bar and you're looking for the next thing. But um, then, yeah, um, it, <laughs> yeah, I feel like it, there's a reason that we all never met in party days um, because we just would have been way too much fun together in such a dangerous <laughs> capacity <laughs> in such a dangerous capacity um samantha i'm really curious uh you, first off is any parts of because you're also a, a mom so you would have stopped drinking as well while you were pregnant and then what was that like for you was it the same kind of like chomping at the bit to get back at it when when it was oh yeah over? <laughs> it was like i was excited to be pregnant and everything but i just did not like not drinking. And I know my sister always joked because she's like, I thought you would be like a great DD like while you're pregnant, but drunk people just annoyed me so much. Like I'd drive her, but I'd complain about the smell of her breath. And you know, like I just, yeah, I could not wait to drink again. So I did go back to it, but I don't know. It's just, I'm the same way, like, I love to drink, like, it's just so much fun, and I just, like Laura said, I really felt like, well, it's just who I am, like, I love drinking, and I think it's so much fun, and it makes mm -hmm. me better. Somehow I find you, like, convince yourself, it's part of the lie that it makes you a better version of yourself, when in reality, that's not true at all. So after I had my son, I did kind of develop some anxiety and stuff, like, a bit of postpartum and I just found that I was like drinking more and more and then I was just kind of in a really bad place like I didn't know how I got there and I felt like I was so lucky to have this healthy baby and um, I don't know I had 
like a, my husband and I have been together for 14 years now. So like our relationship is good, but I just, I don't know, everything kind of piled up. And then I just found myself in a spot that, like I said, I didn't know how I got there or what was going on. But I, when I did stop to think about it, like there's a lot of alcoholism, like in my family and there's a lot of history there where I just started to see it differently. And I, deep down, like it took me a while. And also like Laura said, a lot of day ones. And I just, but deep down I knew it wasn't good. So mm-hmm. I've been like fighting to get to where I am now, I'd say for the past like three years. And um, last year, so 2019, um, I turned 30. And well, in 2018, but my birthday's in December. So I was like, when I'm 30, I'm going to quit drinking. So I did make it like, I don't know, 60 days or something. And then I thought, well, I've done really well. So why not reward myself with that? (laughs) And then, you know, so that kind of continued that I would do like 30 days off. And then I just, in the fall of this past year, I went away for the weekend with my two cousins and my sister. So we grew up together. We're like basically sisters, right? And I just, we were out drinking and I just uh, had a really like honest conversation with them. And I was like, yeah, it's just so weird. You know, like I, I find myself grabbing a drink, but I know like deep down, I like, I don't even want it, but something's making me like grab it. And I just, I was so hungover after that weekend. I was like, this is it. Like Sunday, my sister was driving us home and it was raining out and I felt like death. And she was listening to some weird, depressing CBC interview. And I just, like I was coming home to my family and I just felt terrible. And I was like, this is it. Like I cannot do this anymore. So I found it really hard at first, but I am so grateful. Let's see. <laughs> but yeah, I feel like I'm in a great place now. Okay, you can go in the backyard. <laughs> but yeah, I feel like I'm in a great place now and I really, I still have urges sometimes, but I feel like it's so important to be that good example. Like I think even for my son, who wants to say hi? No, he doesn't. Okay. But for my son, but also I have a lot of kids around me and like a lot of kids that are getting to that age where they're maybe preteens or something. And I just notice them noticing. That's right. And like I'm reading the naked mind right now. And I thought it was really interesting how she says like at school and stuff, you know, they caution the children against alcohol and drugs, but the example that they're seeing at home is not meshing with that. And I just, whenever I feel the urge, I really think of the little ones that, may or may not, even if they don't look up to me, at least I'm like that example for them that, oh, look, she can have fun and she's not drinking. And I always think, oh, if they're ever stuck at a party or something and they need someone, like I want them to know that they can call me because I'll be sober and I can get in the car and come get them. So That's, that was exactly what I did. Yeah. I drank at that age. I, I always told them it's a get out of jail free card. Yeah. I don't care how blasted you are. I don't care what you did. You will get no scolding from me. Your body will scold you the next day. Yes. <laughs> Two aspirins and some water, and I will always come and get you. I don't care what time it is. And I can't tell you how many times I had to rescue them or they Really? And it was, it was really important for them to know there was a responsible sober mm-hmm. adult. And, and you're doing exactly the right thing to raise a kid who's going to respect you. I think that's really smart. Fingers crossed. I love, I love that. I also think it's hard for us, and in, in both of you, all of you have mentioned it, when we drink, we become what we think is this, like, you know, not antisocial, really vibrant version of ourselves without realizing that we're trading that time. We don't get to enjoy that time without the time that we spend feeling depressed and feeling gross and feeling all of the shame that goes along with that. And, and maybe Laura, you can talk to this, but I think it's also about finding ways, not only to let young women know, but to, to find ways to let 
youth know how to express themselves without there being a substance involved and that it is okay that we are that way and that anxiety that we feel and finding different avenues of, of doing that. And um, that seemed impossible to me now that I look, you know, alcohol was the thing that just made you, you awesome. So uh, Laura, if you were to talk to, you know, a youth or a young girl who is looking at getting into drinking because it made her feel the way it made you feel, what kind of advice or even just life experience could you offer up in that situation to try and just maybe give them a different path than the one that we all seem to walk down? Honestly, I, geez, <laughs> I would just say it's not worth it and it's going to turn on you because it's like, I hear the word, like this phrase, it's a rite of passage. Like a lot of kids, it's a rite of passage to be introduced to alcohol and have that first party and experience maybe I'm sure what all of you experience going out and getting drunk and then hiding from your parents, maybe not you. Um, <laughs> but like, it's what you do, but it's not what you have to do. And I feel like I wasted, I learned a lot, but I feel like I wasted 20 years of my life partying. And I'm fortunate that I have another 20, maybe another 20 to live it the opposite way. And I missed out on a lot of stuff like alcohol, like you were saying, you think it um, gives you that personality and that vibrant, outgoing, energetic, amazing, awesome identity, but it doesn't, it does the exact opposite and you, you get blinded by it. It's a lie. I just, I'm angry at it. I'm still new to being sober, but I'm really confident in knowing that I'll be sober. I'm not going to drink again. And I know that because I made a choice, but it'd be, I feel like it'd be really hard. Like I don't have kids and I don't, I'm not surrounded by a lot of kids in my life. Um, I feel like, I just feel like, don't do it. Please don't do it. I just let yeah. them know what I did and what I would choose to do differently. Um, I used to say, I wouldn't change anything. If I was actually given the opportunity, like if a genie came out of a bottle and gave me the opportunity to change um, my choices in life, I would definitely go back and make some changes because I know that I would be maybe going down a different course or be a little bit wiser or just be a little bit healthier sooner in my life or have better relationships with um, my parents. I wouldn't have some of the turmoil that I went through with them and I wouldn't lie as much as I did um, and be a little prouder of myself sooner. I feel like I make it sound really depressing because I'm in a really good place, um, <laughs> no. but it's a lot of regret and I didn't, it just really came and slapped me in the face. Like this last three years, it just was like suddenly like, no, this is, this is not the way alcohol is and everything you've done is just awful. <laughs> you know, it just, it lies to you. It lies to you. Yourself. I really wouldn't. I mean, it's a cultural thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would have made very different choices, too, if I wasn't drinking. But I also wouldn't be where I am now, but for the yeah. path I took. So mm -hmm. I'd, I'd, I'd let you. You seem beautiful to me, Laura. I would, <laughs> I would totally let myself off the hook if I were you. And I think we also, this, the same way we look at situations, we did the best we had with what we knew in those situations. Whatever that was, whatever situation we grew up in, whatever emotional trauma, physical, mental trauma, all of those things that we were also trying to run from, we did the best we could with what we had. And the most beautiful thing is that we're all sitting here where we are. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really great. And I don't know whether my concept in my philosophy in life would be the same if I hadn't have made the choices um I wouldn't change the choices I feel like um because I had to go through it and I and I feel like everything I've been through to this point in my life wasn't without purpose it's, it's the purpose to continue to propel that forward and help in all of the ways that I can um but admitting and sitting in you know and for me it's not only alcohol my alcohol led me down a, a really scary road with cocaine and and drugs and things that almost took my life on multiple occasions. And I have to sit back and I have to be okay and accept all of the shitty choices I made while I was under the influence of those substances. And that was probably the hardest thing for me. Um, because even though I was under the influence of whatever substance, I still have to accept and own what I did, you know, and, and the decisions and choices. And that I think will, um, I've, I, I've sort of circled back through that a little bit faster than maybe even I expected. And just that I can accept it. I, I you know, 
it, and that's just a piece of it. But like Mary Jo said, I, uh, I'm happy all of you made the choices that you made because that's what brought you also into my life that helped me feel inspired to do what it is that I'm doing. So, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change, I wouldn't change anything about any of, <laughs> any of your stories or your journeys. Uh, and it also shows us that we're resilient, right? We're doing something, um, that isn't socially acceptable. Honestly, I find the, the most, the one thing that makes people who drink uncomfortable is people who don't drink. And I think I've, really, I've got to have, <laughs> right? They're like, why? What's going well, on? Well, they feel you? like you're judging them. And maybe we are. I mean, maybe we're judging, looking, going, you don't have to do that, blah, blah, blah. But I, I've really dialed back the judgy bit. Mm. And if people want to drink, they drink. If they ask me if I want to drink, I have, if I'm in a setting where I don't want to say I don't drink, mm -hmm. I say, oh, I'll go get one myself. And I get something with cranberry juice in it that looks like a cocktail. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hang on to that. And then I don't, I, I don't always want to go through that story. I don't drink because they are, people will often say, why don't you drink? I'm going, well, that's my story to tell or not tell. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe I'm just here for the social and I don't feel like telling that story. So I, I give this hint to my students as well. Over the years, quite a few of them have said, well, how do you get through those um, big firm interviews and parties without drinking? And like, how do you say no to a beer or whatever? And I say, I go get my own drink. Mm -hmm. Don't let anyone give you a drink. Not because nobody's going to roofie you, but because right. they say, I'm going to go get a couple beers. I'll bring you one. What would you like? You say, I always say, no, 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 I'll get my own drink. It's okay. I don't. Because as soon as it's in my hand, it's a few inches. <laughs> it's, just, it's that little space, right? I actually, my, uh, Anne, who you met, uh, best friend, studio manager, all of those things, uh, we, we did our first little social visit the other day, and someone asked her, can I get you a drink? And she said, no, I don't drink. And they immediately said to her, well, when did you quit? And she said, I didn't quit. I just don't drink. And it was just so brilliant the way she said it as someone who's never really connected with having an issue with alcohol. And I thought, what a brilliant way to just end the conversation. You know, mm -hmm. there's no story that has to go with it. I didn't quit. I just don't drink. That's something I, I don't do. And mm -hmm. uh, the same way people say I don't smoke cannabis or, you know, eat meat or it's just it was it was a really fast way to end it. And the look on the other person's face was actually what I found the most. Uh, entertaining piece because they couldn't comprehend it. They just like, how do you not drink? Um, <laughs> it was so strange. Um, Sam, Samantha, what is something for for? Because then let's kind of circle back to COVID right now. So there are people in COVID right now who are going into maybe a bit of recovery from alcohol. Maybe they were already in. Uh, maybe you know things have gotten a little bit out of hand. But for people who are struggling with alcohol right now or, or thinking about walking in and out of this dance that we do with it. Um, Samantha, what's some advice or what's like some own personal advice that you, you could give to someone who might be having a bit of an issue right now? I would just, I think that the secret is to be completely honest with yourself because deep down, you know, what's good for you and what's not good for you. And like, I think everyone's journey with substances, alcohol, whatever is their own. And maybe some people can take it or leave it. I'm not one of those people. And deep down I knew that. And it just took me like really listening to that voice and just saying like, it's, it's enough. And I always, I just feel like they need to be hopeful and know like it can start today. It doesn't matter like what you did for the past month or I don't know, like, I know people that are struggling that are close to me right now, and I'm just like, it doesn't matter. You woke up this morning feeling like shit. Let this be the last morning that you wake up feeling like shit because of alcohol. Like, it starts yeah. today. It just, you just have to start, and you can do it. And I, I know it's painful at first, but afterwards, like, the joy that I've experienced from not drinking, like, hmm. I said to my husband the other day, my favorite activity so far this summer is, like, riding bikes with my son and that's just something if i was drinking i'd be like no nah, i'm like it's okay you guys go i want to stay home and drink my wine 
you know what I mean? Like it just, it took so much away from me. So. Agreed. And I, and I, I don't think we really realize that, right? It, it's, uh, you know, it, essentially we're in a pandemic where um, I'm not allowed to be open as a wellness studio to better people's lives in so many capacities, but we're going to allow alcohol to stay open because we can't take the burden of what that would look like on our health system. Um, and that in itself, the fact that we had to do that in itself, I think is a big sign that we need to wake up in, in the world we're living in. Um, but again, that's something we can't push people towards. We can only live our life through example and, and all of you are doing that so beautifully. Um, and I want to ask both, both uh, Mary Jo and Laura the same question. So Laura, what do you think um, is something that you could offer up to people right now who are struggling um, with alcohol or, or what is some good advice that you can offer that helped you? To not drink alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. Just being mindful and really asking yourself why you need it or why do you want to drink? That was one of my major things, like actually like writing it down mm -hmm. and like recognizing like, what am I feeling right now? Like if I get in an argument with someone, if my response is I need a glass of wine, do you need a glass of wine or do you need to go and sit down, do some deep breathing and go back and figure out, talk to your partner, talk to your friend about why you're fighting. Like actually ask yourself those questions because that was a um, exercise I did for myself when I'd get that like urge. I'm like, okay, where is this coming from? What, what just happened? Is it the weather? Is it stressed? Is, is someone doing something you don't like? Um, did my mom say something passive aggressive? Did I say something passive aggressive? It's just recognizing. God, you're killing me. Triggered. I never say things that drive my kids. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, just like anything that could be just causing a, a reaction or, an, or a reason. I didn't, I didn't even need really a reason to drink, but like giving you that excuse for me that oftentimes was like a reason that I would just want to start drinking just anything like, Oh, it's, he just smiled at me the wrong way. Let's go get a beer. It's so true. You know, it starts off as like the, the time that you're waiting for on Friday, four o'clock on Friday. And the next thing you know, it's four o'clock on Tuesday. And then it's like yeah. Sunday and you're drinking and it's, it, it, it does kind of creep in. It's uh, always that excuse. Um, and it is, I think before we realize it's an excuse, it is an excuse. Mm -hmm. Um, Mary Jo, what would you offer to people who are, um, maybe dealing with that battle or just even someone who's considering walking away from, from alcohol because they're recognizing that it's a bit of an issue? Um, be kind to yourself. Like don't, it's a journey, not a destination. And I think, you know, anyone can make a good decision one day and a bad one the next so if you if you make this good decision okay i'm not going to drink and then you make a bad one that doesn't mean you have to just live with the bad one now as samantha says it starts this morning so it starts today you just to just start again i i didn't because i was pregnant i had very little trouble quitting drinking and because i realized very quickly how much safer i was when i didn't drink it was easy the hardest thing for me to quit was cigarettes. Oh my God. Really hard to quit. Like really, just, oh. So I would party smoke. I would, um, you know, I would bum cigarettes. Because if I bought them, then I was smoking again. But if I bummed them, I wasn't. <laughs> um, There's so much logic to that. So I know, right? <laughs> Um, I felt so cool and elegant when I smoked because I smelled horrible, but leave that aside. So um, I would, my best advice would be it really is about being easy and focusing on uh, that moment and that day and just be super kind to yourself. Okay, you went out, you fell off the wagon, you got drunk last night. Shit happens, you know. Um, breathe. Do kind things for yourself and try again. You know, don't um, don't throw it in because that's all I really have to say. And just just have your have your um, strategies ready. 
-hmm. So when you, if you know you're going to a party or you know you're going to be with folks who like to drink and you know you're very tempted when you're with them, have your strategies planned. What will I have in my hand that's not a beer? What will I say if someone offers me a drink? But be ready. Don't, don't free ball that. Be ready with a, an answer, like a, a fake drink. Um, I will drink uh, um, de-alcoholized beer about once a year. I'll have one of those. And then I realize I don't really like the taste. So, <laughs> you know, so I, I would say be kind, be kind, be kind, be kind to the people around you that are drinking, you know, and when they, I have a friend who has a very responsible job and he, um, very responsible job. And he managed to get picked up for a drunk driving and it was a disaster. Like he couldn't get to work. He couldn't drive his kids around. There was all kinds of stuff. So for three months until he could get one of the things that goes in your car and you can blow and then get your license back for three months, he couldn't drive. I drove him. Everywhere. I drove him. Hello, pupper. I drove him to work. I drove him to go shopping. I drove his kids. I mean, it was so do that kind of thing. Like, to, you know, anybody who's struggling, I would say, give them the opportunity. Give them the space. Let them know that you're there as a kind, non-judgy resource. And he kept saying things to me like, I'll never do this again. You've been so nice. I owe it to you. And I'm going, hey, you don't owe me anything. If you fall off the wagon, I'm still here. I'm still yeah. here. You know, if it happens to you again, I, I'm still your friend. I would still do exactly the same thing. So I think that's all just kind, kind, kind. Be as kind as you can to yourself and the people that you know that are struggling. I love that you say that about the people that you know, because I think if there's anything that any of us can relate to uh, when it comes to drinking and in the excess that maybe we used to do it in is because there was something rooted so much deeper, right? And, and whether that's even just um, as simple as our own lack of self-love that we have, that we turn to it, um, there's, there's always a root cause of, of a reason that we abuse any form of substance or a reason that we have any addiction um, that maybe isn't a substance, even gambling, shopping, you know, all of those kinds of things also. Um, I will say one of the things I'm the most grateful for in not um, drinking anymore uh, or turning to those things is that I now feel I can respond to life. I'm not reacting. I'm not in this like high um, reactive state where everything's either really great or it's just like really fucking shitty and, and I'm stuck in this ceiling to the floor. There's just this uh, sort of steady state, this like mm -hmm. beautiful stasis that I get to feel in my life now and, and I get to decide. Um, alcohol or substance doesn't get to decide how I'm going to, how I'm going to do those things. Um, Ladies, I actually hope this is just the first of many conversations where we can come together uh, as a group and sort of share um, what has to do with alcoholism or substance abuse or different ways in which we cope in our life. Because I believe that by living our truth and doing these things, that is what helps other people understand it. And that's the best way that we can do it, whether with, um, hi, whether with, uh, with kids or not, that is kind of the best way that we can do it. And um, I'm just so appreciative that every one of you have walked into my life uh, because when I have my moments where I feel like um, maybe I'm not cut out for this, I just turn to the people who I know already are and that's, you know, the three of you. And if it's a day where I feel like maybe myself is the person I would let down, um, the three of you do pop into my mind quite regularly. So you keep me... Uh, on a beautiful track also. So I am very grateful. Whether I, I, I say it enough, I'm grateful for each one of you. Uh, and each one of you are a pillar in my recovery and my journey. So. That is very Thank touching. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You made <it> here. <laughs> As I'm like, I'm sorry, we should end the conversation. It's okay. <laughs> um, so, so I love that. I love that. Uh, and I'm just appreciative to all of you. And thank you um, for taking the time today to step in. Um, I can't wait to, to share this episode uh, with all of you, but to also share this episode with our community and the people around us, because you are all just so powerful. And, um, and don't, don't forget that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for including us. That was lovely. Thanks, Ashley.
My pleasure. Have a wonderful afternoon. Um, you will be hearing from me again soon. Um, and just, just, yeah, thank you. I appreciate all of you in such a special way. So, so I hope you have a great day. You too. Nice meeting everyone. Yeah, nice Great to meet time. you guys. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Are Again, a little teary um, because of how incredibly important those women are to my journey and what it is that I'm doing in my life. And so um, I think just a message for anyone who's really standing in and living your truth, you never know at what point your journey and your story is gonna impact somebody else. So just keep doing that in every capacity. Um, thank you, thank you for another episode. We'll see you soon. And I hope every one of you has a wonderful afternoon.